A professor once told me, whenever possible, bring your patient a glass of water. This should be your first line of treatment. The reason behind this is that the body is always trying to heal itself when it's sick, and we need to do whatever we can to facilitate that process. This fundamental advice led me to change completely my perception of my role as a medical doctor. Our job was not necessarily to cure the body directly, but rather to help the body heal itself. We could do this by, for example, improving our cellular environment. And we do this with a glass of water, for example, or with the pills that we put in our patients. But also by empowering the genes that can restore the patient's health. Our genes is the strongest defense mechanism we have. In fact, did you know that every day we produce cancer cells in many of our organs? And there is a special group of genes that is charged of destroying them and constantly keeping us healthy. Now, why does it seem as if our bodies sometimes forget to use these useful cancer-destroying genes and we get sick, we get cancer? And more importantly, what can we do to restore and empower our genes? These questions led me to study genetics, epigenetics, and eventually I ended up hacking up a bacteria immune system to empower our genes. Let me show, share with you today how the power I discovered inside our DNA and how a revolutionary technique called CRISPR can help unleash the power of our genes. Now, the human genome is a fixed code, very much like this, but it's shared by every cell in our body. Now, this code has roughly 20,000 genes, a little bit less. Now, if you, if you think about it, 20,000 genes is not that much. If you put this into perspective, even a small hardware store have has more than 25,000 different products, a small one. And a bigger store will have more than 60,000 different products. You can get online and find more than 300,000 <coughs> different products. So our catalog of genes of 20,000 is not that, var it's not, doesn't have the variety we need. And I want you to picture our cells as a structure built by our nucleus using this catalog. How can this nucleus build all sorts of cells that compose us? The muscle cells, the skin cells, even the neurons. Well, we have something called epigenetics. And epigenetics works like this stack of post-it marks. It actually, through their epigenetic marks, it creates bookmarks in our catalog of genes. And these bookmarks tell the nucleus which genes are on and which genes are off, which materials do he, does he need to get from this catalog of genes to build the cell. So a combination of bookmarks around this catalog allows him to build a muscle cell. But a different set of bookmarks allows him to build a skin cell and a third one a neuron and so on. Now imagine each one of our cells as a small house. And when you group those houses together in neighborhoods, we each one of those with a specific function, they generate energy, they conduct trade around the body, they distribute the goods that we absorb, or they eliminate the garbage produced by other organs. They form this big and complex city, full of variety and interactions. Now, this city is built using one single set of very limited amount of genes, of materials. Now, the beauty of this system of epigenetics is that the system is dynamic <coughs> and it adapts to the environment. <coughs> so there are actually things that you can do to improve the genetic balance inside of you. Things like eating healthy, doing exercise, meditate, or like my professor said, drink a healthy amount of fresh water. All of these things 
actually change the bookmarks and has an impact in ourselves. Now, on the contrary, if you eat too much sugar or salt, uh, you smoke, you become too stressed over time, or you drink too much alcohol, all of these things also affect our bookmarks and can lead to the path to a genetic imbalance in our cells. Now to put this in a practical way, join me to travel to Langsville, where we can produce energy out of thin air. Now Langsville faces a terrible danger because the city likes to smoke and the air becomes polluted around Langsville. And this damage every one of, it, of those houses. And the nucleus needs to adapt to this toxic environment. And how, has, how does he do that? By changing the bookmarks. And he starts messing up, activating one gene, deactivating the other one. And this can be very, very risky because at some point, the house can change and this can lead to a cancer cell. Now, here comes the good guys, the group of genes that I was talking about. These are the tumor suppressor genes. This is one bookmark you don't want to lose because they are the ones that need to detect and repair every damage we, we do to our cells. And if they cannot repair it, they will initiate a process of controlled demolition of the house to make sure it doesn't get cancerous. Although we use a more fancy term called apoptosis, but it's basically that. It destroys the cancer cell and it keeps us healthy. Now, right now, every one of us, everyone in the audience and myself is producing one of these cancer cells. One rogue cell wants to try to become that red house at this very moment. And these genes are the ones that are active and protecting us by killing or repairing those cells. These are the keepers of our genetic balance. But that genetic balance can be lost. And if the cells start losing bookmarks because the damage of, of the time gets accumulated, it can lose one critical bookmark, that tumor suppressor bookmark. And if you lose that, that defense mechanism, the cell become unhinged and start proliferating everywhere. And it doesn't just create havoc locally in Langsville. Over time, it will detach from the neighborhood matrix and will try to invade other organs, other neighborhoods, in a process we call metastasis that is observed in the late stages of cancer. Now I want you to think really hard about this bookmark that disappeared because it plays a key role in the treatment I'm gonna show you. The gene codified by that bookmark inside the catalog hasn't been changed. The gene still remains within that catalog. It's just that the nucleus doesn't know it needs to read it because the bookmark disappeared. The bookmark vanished because of the damage we create. Do you see why would it be that important if we could restore that dormant tumor suppressor gene? But what can we do to restore it? Even if our diet, exercise, meditation might not be enough, can we restore and reinstall an artificial bookmark to tell the nucleus to use back that tumor suppressor? Well, a couple of years ago, a new technique called CRISPR started a revolution in the scientific community because it expanded the toolkit we have to control our genome. CRISPR stands for Cluster Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And it doesn't make any more sense to me than it does for you. So let me assure you, forget about that, just let's call it CRISPR. What it is, is the immune system of bacteria to protect itself against viruses. It does it by recognizes, recognizing all the invaders and destroying, it, destroying them, cutting them in half. The system works actually in a two part. The first one 
is a programmable targeting system, very much like a GPS, in the form of an RNA guide. This RNA guide has a sequence that can find any other sequence in our DNA or whichever other DNA we want to target, and when it finds its match, it binds to that position. Now comes the second part of the system, a big fat protein called Cas9. And Cas9 has this little pair of scissors, and with them, it can cut the DNA. If you happen to be a virus, you get cut in half, good luck, you are dead. <laughs> now, we don't want to go around cutting our genes, right? So what do we do? We exchange those scissors by a big flashy bookmark. This is called, in the scientific term, an activator domain. Because what it does is that it activates the gene expression wherever it is installed. It forced the cell to read the gene or the region of the code next to it. So when the Cas9 can install this, where our RNA guide is targeted, it will start producing that gene. Now, if you happen to target it to a tumor suppressor gene nearby, the cell would be forced to start expressing that tumor suppressor gene. And that's what we did. We decided to target one of our tumor suppressor in this big catalog of genes, armed with this, ca this cast line with the big flashy bookmark. Now, if you go back to the cancer cell, there's one more challenge that hasn't been met so far, and it's that the cancer cell will do whatever it can to prevent us of react to reactivate that tumor suppressor gene, because it would jeopardize its dreams of global domination. It'll have systems in place to prevent the expression of this tumor suppressor gene. So we had to use the state-of-the-art activator models engineered so far, the biggest and flashiest bookmark, basically, in order to activate this in an enough level to be relevant. And also, you need to choose your targets very well. You have multiple tumor suppressors that you can target. And we did that by targeting to a very well-studied tumor suppressor called MASPIN. MASPIN is relevant in, in lung cancer. And we ship this system into the lung cancer cells. And the gene expression went up more than 22,000 times and reached the level of a normal cell. Can you imagine that? A cancer cell that started to re-express a tumor suppressor gene up to the level of a normal cell. What did we observe? Well, the cancer cells stopped growing at the rate of a cancer cell, are more like a normal cell. And even, we saw signs of apoptosis. Remember that fancy term that I explained about controlled demolition? The cells start dying. So we decided to try this in another organ where, beside the lung, where it's also relevant, this tumor suppressor gene called maspin and that is in breast cancer. And we observed the same results. The cells stopped growing, and they started committing apoptosis. Finally, we decided to test another tumor suppressor gene called Reprimo, that is relevant in gastric cancer. And the results were the same. Once the expression of the gene of this Reprimo, another tumor suppressor gene, went up, the cells stopped growing and start committing apoptosis. By these experiments, we show that we can use CRISPR in cancer cells to wake up those tumor suppressor genes and use them to cure cancer. Now, I know there are still major limitations to this technology, and we need to do a lot of work before we can put together a therapy that can reach the patients. The main challenge is to take this big fat protein called Cas9 and its tiny RNA guide into the cells. And this has been one of the biggest bottleneck of CRISPR technology so far. But also, we need to select the best targets that we are going to use this technology with. And not just depending on the organs, but on a personalized assessment of each patient genetic imbalance. Despite these limitations, I'm excited because we're just incremental steps away 
from taking this technology are controlling the expression of our genes and tapping the tremendous power that is hidden in our DNA. By adapting this technology to activate genes, we might not just treat cancer, but we could look at other diseases where genetic imbalance is important, blood pressure, diabetes, metabolic diseases, turning on fat-burning proteins, regenerative medicine. The applications are endless. So, we can use CRISPR to empower our genes. And by doing that, we can do our job to help the body heal itself. Your genes can cure you. And now we have the technology to unleash their true potential. Thank you.